Hi everyone and welcome to a new video tutorial. Today we're talking gyros, what's possibly the smartest gyro on the market at the moment, and that is the Powerbox Systems iGyro Sat. Not only is it tiny, but it's smart. Why? Because it just plugs in and works. What do I mean? Well, basically, you can now add gyro capability to the Powerbox receivers or even to new Powerboxes such as the new Powerbox Pioneer. Basically, starting off with a basic product, a receiver or a Powerbox, which does all the basic usual functions, simply plug this in and all of a sudden it turns it into a next level. You now have gyro integration and no setup to make it work. Just connect and go. You then program it entirely from the radio. So no buttons, no adapter cards, nothing. Just access the menu, adjust it as required, go have fun, don't waste time. And that's what we're gonna show you today. I'm going to be installing it into my RC Factory Edge and basically converting the standard receiver that I have in it to an equivalent to say the Spectrum AS3X. So if you like that kind of gyro locked in feeling, even in small foamy planes or large jets, such as this one that has the same gyro in it, well, all you need is to plug this into the receiver and you gain the same functionality with even more options. So let's get straight into installing it and then go do some flying. Before setting up any electric plane, it's always recommendable to remove the prop just to make sure that there's not gonna be any kind of runaways or flyaways. So just one screw, we'll just take the prop off real quick, then we'll get to the setup. Moving on to the transmitter. As with any model, the first step is to actually create all the functions and set up the sub trim and endpoints as required. Now in this case, it's a very simple model. So we just have two aileron servos on channel outputs two and five, elevator on channel three, and rudder on channel four. Of course, we have a throttle channel, and then we've had to add one extra channel, which is controlled by this slider here, and that's going to control the amount of gyro gain input into our model. And that's on output number six. Once we have our model set up, regardless of how simple or complex it is, bear in mind I'm using this exact same system for my SAB Lizard, which has delta wing, vector elevator, vector rudder, dual rudders, steering, brakes, etc. All of that is exactly the same. We just add on one gyro gain extra onto the end of it. The next step is now to start programming the gyro itself. Now, as this is done from the radio, in the case of Powerbox and Jetty, that's done via the telemetry. If you're using Futaba, you have to use the Bluecom adapter and your mobile device, or a USB adapter and your computer. However, we're going to be using the core radio. So, to gain access into that telemetry, we need to go into the device to which it's actually connected. Now, in this case, it's connected directly to the receiver. However, in the case of my SAB Lizard, it goes via the Powerbox Pioneer. So just bear that in mind. You need to access it through whichever device it's actually connected directly into. So we can choose any one of the values for that particular sensor. So in this case, the receiver, any one of those will do because we just need to gain access to the menu of that device. So the menu of my receiver. So if we open the menu and it's going to find all the information held on the receiver and on the gyro and it's going to show me and we can then change it and modify it as required. First screen, general settings. This relates to the receiver itself. So we're going to pretty much ignore that straight away. I'm going to move on to the second page and we have fine tuning. We'll get into this in a moment. That's where we adjust all the gyro settings for each one of those channels. Airspeed factor. This only applies if using the iGyro sat in conjunction with the Powerbox Systems GPS2. In that case, the gyro K2 
can have the gain automatically increased or decreased depending on the speed at which you're flying. If you're not using it, you can simply ignore this page entirely. Input mapping. Now, the gyro needs to know which of the receiver outputs or the pioneer outputs are actually those of the gyro channels that we wish to control. So here we have, as we said earlier, my two aileron channels are in numbers two and five. My elevator is in channel output number three and my rudder is in output number four. Now, if any of these need changing, as I have set up this previously, all you need to do is just modify it by decreasing the numbers or increasing the numbers. Now, do give it a second just to update, because bear in mind what you're doing is you're actually updating the information here. That's being sent off to the receiver. The receiver is updating the iGyro. The iGyro is confirming and it's sending it back to the transmitter, which is when it's actually showing you the current updated figure and value. So just give that a second. It can take a little bit longer than you may expect, but no more than a second or two. And then at the bottom here, we have one extra channel, which is the gain. So it knows which one of all of those channels is the one controlling how much gyro gain we want and need. And again, just modify that as required to coincide with your chosen slider. And finally, we have the actual gyro setup itself. Now, here is where we're going to tell the gyro its mounting position. In other words, whether it's laying flat, sideways, upside down, crossed, or anywhere, as it can be mounted in any direction, as long as they're always at 90 degrees. And then we have the stick endpoints, which is going to teach it what the maximum travel is, so it's not going to damage any servos by going beyond the established endpoints. So let's start with the mounting position. We need to activate. We're then going to have to lift the tail up. You may need to lift it up and down slightly a couple of times for the gyro to start getting the idea and then lift it up quickly and hold it there. The trim will then go back to center and that's confirming that it's locked in that position. We'll then have to move it sideways to the right as indicated on the screen do the same again if necessary so the rudder starts moving and then it will lock in place and go back to center. So we'll do that now. And just like that, the gyro now knows which orientation it has within the model. The next step, the stick endpoints not only serves to limit the travel of the servo to the endpoints defined within the radio, but it will also teach the gyro which way those servos need to correct in order to get the plane going in the right direction. In other words, assuring that the gyro isn't reversed. That doesn't mean that after finishing this process, you should always double check just to make doubly sure. So if we activate and just follow the instructions on screen. So aileron right, next, aileron left, next, elevator up, next, and you're getting the idea, elevator down, next. Rudder right and rudder left. And just like that, the gyro now knows its endpoints because we already set those up before starting this whole process. And it also now knows which direction the gyro needs to correct whenever the plane gets buffeted about in the sky. In doing this, it also detects any other mixes that you have in the radio. So if you're using ailerons as flaps, so flapperons, it will automatically detect. Same as if you have any mixes, aileron to elevator, to rudder, etc., it will compensate as it will with differential aileron. With that screen completed, we can now go back, back, and back again, 
Fine tuning. Now this is the screen where we said that we can control the actual gain settings for each one of those outputs on the gyro. So first of all we have axis selection. So we have all those channels that we set up earlier. Aileron A, Aileron B, Elevator A, Elevator B, Rudder A, Rudder B. Let's go back and start with Aileron A. We then have range selection. Now each channel has two sets of banks of gyro gain in addition to the third one which is off. So basically at zero the gyro is off. From zero to minus 100 is bank A and from zero to plus 100 it's bank B. In bank A we would have these settings and then in bank B we can have an entirely different load of settings. You'll need to go through each one of these and set them up as you desire for your particular model. The gain channel on this is actually controlled not only by this percentage but of course by the slider that we set up earlier. What this means is that even if we have our slider all the way over to minus 100, the amount of gain that it's going to be giving is actually only 70%. That means that you can limit the maximum gyro gain even within the 100% travel of your particular slider. Going into attitude assist, this is also known as heading hold. So when that's deactivated, the gyro is only going to try and compensate for those gusts of wind or external influences that just move the plane quickly. It kind of bounces out the way and it tries to have it bounce back again. If we activate that, what that's going to do is it's not only going to try and do that, but it's also going to try and keep that model going in that same direction. This doesn't mean that it flies for you, it just means that it kind of tends to track a little bit truer. In doing so, you need to be careful because in my opinion, you can use it for ailerons, you can use it for elevator, but you should never use it for rudder because unless you turn with rudder, whenever you do a turn, the rudder is going to try and continue going straight because you're not touching the stick, i.e. deactivating the gyro. The only time when I would recommend having the heading hold or attitude assist activated on rudder is in the case of a 3D jet, and even then it should only be activated when you're already in a hover or a harrier position. As soon as you finish the maneuver, you would have to deactivate it and go back to only using normal gain. Now that's quite simple. That's the, the gyro settings that we've seen previously in most other Powerbox gyros. This is where we get into some slightly more advanced techniques and options. The characteristic is kind of the speed at which the gyro reacts to those gusts of wind or external influences. So, if you feel that the gyro is correcting a bit too quick, then you can change it down to soft. However, if you feel that the plane is still being blown about a little bit, you can increase it up to a hard or even a super hard, ultra hard feel. That just means that the gyro is going to react even quicker, even sooner to those external influences. Stick priority. This is the one that indicates how quickly the gyro turns off when you move the stick. The standard has always been 100%. So in other words, when the stick gets to 100%, the gyro is at zero, the gyro is off. However, we can increase this. So if we increase this to say 200%, by the time you got halfway there, the gyro would be off and then from halfway to 100%, the gyro simply wouldn't be there. Equally, albeit a little bit more dangerously, use cautiously, you can also reduce that, which means that even when you do move the stick, the gyro remains active. Now this is particularly interesting for things like 3D jets on the vector, because it means you still have control over where the plane's going, However, you're not necessarily changing the attitude or the attitude that the gyro is trying to gain. 
In a lot of cases though, if you're using a standard model, you'll be able to leave that at 100%. And then finally we have the lock feel, or how locked in that gyro feels. Basically, this is a case again of how quickly or how aggressively, more to the point, that gyro reacts. So if you're using a scale model, chances are you'll want the gyro to be unnoticeable. It's just there to help you out with those few bumps. However, if you're flying an aerobatic or a highly aggressive jet, well, you may want that to be a, a real sharp stop when you do a four point roll or an eight point roll or anything like that. In that case, you can increase the lock in feel and have that respond in a much more aggressive way and just make that gyro duck really lock into that position. Either way, all three of these settings need to be tried and tested on each particular model. There's not going to be a perfect setting for everything. So take it in small in increments, try it out, see which ones you like, see which ones you don't, and find the right setting for you. After all, you do have two banks, remember. So you can use bank A with a standard setting and use bank B, for example, for a test. If you like it, you continue flying in it and then modifying it. Or if you don't like it, well, you can always go back to using bank A, which is tried, tested, and you know that it, at least you have gyro for the rest of the flight. Once you've done that for aileron A, you would replicate it normally for aileron B, and then you would set up elevator A as necessary, and the same again for rudder. Once you've done that, Go back to the model, double check that everything's working in the right direction. Make sure you know exactly what's happening and when for when you're going to be flying the model. Have someone with you, even if necessary, to control that gyro for you. If you're not used to using gyro or releasing fingers from the stick. And just do, in general, whatever you feel comfortable with. Just always make only very small increments at each time with the gyro and test, test, test. I'm Martin Pickering and I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this one. Subscribing is always, always free and just means that YouTube shows you my latest videos once uploaded and you won't miss out. So hit that subscribe button now. While at it, why not check out my super cool new lineup of t-shirt designs like this one all available in my online merch store with worldwide shipping. With several designs and colours to choose between, I'm sure that you'll love at least one of them. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.